my name is Claire and I have willingly created a household of my school teachers on The Sims. Why? I have absolutely no idea. I mean, they weren't even a particular brand of teachers. I had good relationships with them, I respected them, I listened to them in class, you know, I was a normal student. But something just told me that building a bacheloresque mansion and filling it with selected school staff and reenacting Big Brother scenarios was a good idea. <laughs> Does that make me a psychopath? And if I'm not alone, which I pray I am, the question is, are you? I've been playing The Sims ever since one was released way back in 2003. Among my fondest memories were of messing with my sister's households or excitedly showing my nana how Sims can woohoo. It's sandbox style gameplay, endless narrative opportunities, and the freedom to unleash rage on those in your life who have done you wrong give us plenty to go off as to what makes us so in love with this game. And the 200 million copies this franchise has sold over its two decades is just shameful proof that we really love controlling the lives of virtual humans. Now, as I was perusing the web, I realized there is a lot of content out there that strives to explain what it is that makes The Sims so popular. Self-fulfillment, a sense of empowerment, the freedom to recreate your perfect life while destroying others without consequence being among the reasons. But we're not going to focus anymore on that. Instead, I'm more interested in how we play The Sims and whether the way we approach gameplay reflects our own individualism in ways we might not expect. Let's begin by talking a little bit about self-portrayal. While not necessarily an official definition in psychology studies, self-betrayal in a nutshell refers to an often subconscious tendency for us to inject ourselves into experiences, namely those that are interactive. In literary terms, self-betrayal is a highly subjective process, meaning everyone is guaranteed to project different interpretations in different ways. And a lot of the time, we don't even realize when we're doing it. For those like myself who don't have a degree in psychology, self-betrayal is interesting to consider in terms of gameplay because we're bound to discover a connection between the way we play and who we are. There are different ways we might incorporate self-betrayal in how we experience games. One is through a game's narrative. Have you ever played Animal Crossing and established little stories that obviously weren't designed or even intended by Nintendo? Take my passion on and off relationship with Samson. He gifted me this adorable sailor's dress and is still yet to comment on how beautiful it makes me look. And on top of that, he doesn't even appreciate that I dumped a Zucker for him. Or if you want to be a little less extreme, every Mario Odyssey screenshot I sunk a disturbing amount of time executing. Games which tend to be greater in narrative scope, such as RPGs, provide plenty of room to add secret and wacky narratives. Think about your Dragonborn's adventures in Skyrim, your intrinsic go-to morality that you want your protagonist to express, and how you choose to interact with, or torture, NPCs. Disrespect the law and you disrespect me. No matter what kinds of games you play, all players to a certain extent will project unique and subjective stories onto characters, worlds, and events, even when they don't technically exist. So this is a form of self-betrayal because you want to ask yourself, why does this interpretation of fiction feel real to me? Now, The Sims is an odd bean because it's a simulator. I know, wow. It carries no set narrative, there's not even a goal. You literally just create a family, build a house, and Pleasant View is your oyster. Even those little nuggets of existing story provide endless scope for you to play around with and absolutely ruin. Neighbourhood descriptions, story-driven expansions like Strangerville, and even preset households from the beloved Goths to Travis Scott. His name is actually Travis Scott. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> with so little to hold you back, there's no telling what we could do with these endless gameplay opportunities. So then, is it possible that, as a result, we tend to project our own subconsciousness, even our personality, onto the way we play The Sims. Will Wright, hailed creator of The Sims, stated that much of the story is completed by the player's personal experiences and aesthetics. We, the player, fill in the blanks left empty by the developers. I want you to think about the last household you really committed to on The Sims. Did you set them into systematic routines? Did they get up every morning, take a shower, head off to work and prepare dinner each night at a fairly consistent time of the day? Or were you a bit more chaotic and random, letting your sims loose in a karaoke bar at 5am or filling their hunger need by using the microwave at the science lab? Did you tend to put time and effort into establishing meaningful, widespread friendships or had no issues with having your sim act totally whack with literally everybody? Are you a perfectionist that ensures your sim's needs are constantly in the green? Like me! Or someone who remembers last minute to put a toilet on the lot? Also like me! And it turns out there are actual qualified scientists who have looked into this. 
what you thought, like, I knew what I was talking about this whole time. <laughs> You know, I didn't mean to put this mint stem in, um, but it's kind of stuck there because it's grown and I'm really enjoying watching it grow. So there you go. Anyway, psychology. The study in question was one conducted by a sir named Thaddeus Griebel, which is just the best name ever, if we're being honest, who looked at the way a group of participants played The Sims 2 based on two hypotheses. One, that players who tended to be organized and more socially oriented will treat their Sims lives as such. And two, the participants will implement their own personal values and life experiences into the scenarios they create for their sims. To do so, they had the players fill out various personality tests, recorded their responses to value-based questionnaires, and then observed how they played for around five sim weeks, or 10 to 12 in-game hours. As expected, the results actually fulfilled these hypotheses. For one, 70% of the participants reported that they recreated aspects of their present life in their sims lives, 50% reported that they'd created families that resembled the structure of their own, and 40% specified that their sims carried the same interests, hobbies, and aspirations as themselves. The study also went on to explore how personality carries over into gameplay habits. For example, people who scored higher in neuroticism were more likely to change the careers of their sims on a regular basis, while people who were considered more conscientious, 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 I can't pronounce it placed higher importance on keeping their sims house clean or having them learning a wide range of skills. Even the player's responses to fidelity, marriage and dating tended to reveal an application of personal beliefs, with the study finding that the player's personal ideals for navigating romantic relationships came to be reflected in their gameplay. John Sulsul Sula, a cybercultural psych- <laughs> <clears throat> John Sula, a cyberculture psychologist most known for his analysis of human interactions online, explained that in The Sims, everybody gets the opportunity to create characters that reflect who we are, what we hope and dream, and what we fear. I mean, if this is the case, could it actually be a thing for The Sims to be used in a clinical setting? Like some sort of Rorschach test for personality. Imagine that. Only the beginning of this year, which is kind of freakishly good timing, there was an article released by the Daily Mail. Another experiment was done that had researchers monitoring the gameplay of subjects assessed for psychopathic traits. They observed that those people who were found to display higher levels of psychopathic traits were also more likely to show aggressive and unprovoked mean behaviours toward other characters in the game. They were also found to have fewer interactions in-game, which the researchers classified as being friendly, funny and charming. What I do love, however, is that the article especially highlights that if you are in the habit of removing pulls from a ladder or a ladder from a pool, <laughs> you are not a psychopath, necessarily. So there you go, click on answer to this video. What more can you ask for? Now, I probably don't need to tell you that psychopathy is a real illness that is a lot more complicated to diagnose, at least more challenging than recognizing it in a video game. Not to mention that both examples of experimental research had some limitations, but there's no denying that this connection exists. And comparing the limitations of The Sims 2 and 3 to the slightly more accurate to reality graphics and systems of the newer Sims 4, perhaps if another study was to be done on a larger scale today, we'd get some more tangible results. Bottom line, we all play The Sims in different ways, regardless of our personality. It could be that you're sitting through this video with a massive duh ringing through your mind, and you're not wrong. In a way, this is deceptively obvious stuff. But have you ever really sat back and thought not only about how a game that simulates life might reflect your own, but how aspects of your personality are reflected in all the games you interact with? What does your preference in playing as a rogue say about who you are? Why do you prefer a methodical, strategy-driven RTS over a fast-paced and reaction-time-focused hack and slash, or vice versa? What about your perfectionism and having to collect every single damn Korok seed in Breath of the Wild? That's borderline masochism, by the way. You should get that checked out. In all seriousness, I'd actually be really interested to read your comments about your own playstyle in The Sims. How do your Sims reflect your opinions about romantic relationships? How does your main household's family dynamic reflect your own or the one you grew up in? How does your management of their lives showcase your perfectionism or laid back attitude? Maybe we could conduct this research like virtually, you know, a full on mass research conducted throughout everyone online that analyzes the subconscious tendencies of Sims players. Wow. Or I could just go back to my megalomaniacal robot household. Yeah, I think I'll do that. 
Well, what can I say? I really appreciate you giving 15 to 20 minutes, however long this video is gonna be, <laughs> to listen to my spiel. This is actually my very first video for this channel, so I'm sort of testing the waters a little bit. I'm hoping to sort of continue with content that will make you reflect on your own gaming habits and interests while digging into a bit of films as well now and then and TV. Um, just something that sort of promotes a general discourse about completely fictional worlds and ideas. <laughs> Cause you know, what else is there to talk about? I meant what I said about you commenting your Sims experiences because I really need to know that I'm not alone right now in my own habits. Also check back to the poll I put in earlier in this video. If you want to submit a response, it'd be really cool to get your own idea. I'm going to aim to get probably one video up a week, depending on how things go. So thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next time. Zuba Tube, love a <laughs> <laughs>